So, brothers and sisters, if you're trying to think about how to recapture the wow factor when we read the Word of God, and I want to uh, look at John chapter 1 and share with you something that really has stayed with me for the last two, three years, a wow factor which I was unaware of. I mean, one of the benefits, one of the privileges we have in an Internet age with electronic tools that we can look at Scripture in some detail ourselves. We can get... Uh, uh, Bible programs online, we can look at any version we want, and we look at the, uh, the word for word literal. So we can, you know, we can, we ourselves can get back to those words written, even if we can't, which I can't read Greek or Hebrew, we can see the word and we can see the form in which it was written. And we can think, well, you know, our brothers and sisters read that. So if you open your Bibles to John chapter 1 and you look at the first two verses of John chapter 1, and I didn't know about this until recently, but it, it's got a certain architecture, right? The text has got an architecture. It's got a shape about it. It's got an organization about it, which is majestic. That's all I can say. And the language that is used to describe it, um, when people see it perhaps for the first time, is the language of beauty. You know, it's, not, it's the language of, wow, that's awesome. That's, 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 that's terrific. That's lovely. That's the language. Now, this is a very, very simple example. This is called step parallelism. And what that means, as so I'm told, is that the, the last word of a clause is the first word of the next clause. And it's not accidental. It's not, it's not by chance that's happened. This is the word of God. God has written his word through his apostles in this way to give us the wow factor. So you think, well, in the beginning was the word. The Word. And the Word was with God. And what God was, the Word was. The Word, the same. So if I could have put the slide further over, the step would have come towards me. So, okay, you can see you're going down, or perhaps you should be saying we're going up the steps. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What God was, the Word was. The same was in the beginning with God. So there's, it's taking us step by step through a process of thought. Oh, when we do our daily Bible readings, you know, that takes about one and a half seconds to read. <laughs> and we've raced on to the next thing. And somebody should have said to me, I stop, go back, just read it ever so slowly. Try and follow the train of thought. It is at the same time a concentric pattern. I mean, this is astonishing architecture. Imagine a building having two shapes. You say, well, that, that can't be possible. But those first two verses have two shapes. So it begins in the beginning and it ends in the beginning. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and what God was, the Word was, the same was in the beginning with God. It starts and ends in the same place. God is the beginning and ending of the thought. God, in the beginning, expressed his mind in his word. That word was the mind of God. That's what was there in the beginning. And we might say, well, what was the beginning? Is it Genesis chapter 1? My current, uh, I oscillate, I, I think it's not Genesis chapter 1. Of course, the references to Genesis chapter 1 are, are, are obvious and, and indisputable, but it's not talking about Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, as a beginning in time. I think it's talking about the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ when the word was manifest in flesh through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that all the prophecies that had gone before now found their reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, I think obviously there are references to the creation. And this is the new creation that we're talking about here. When we uh, go into it, these, these sort of forms have... Of terms, reverse, concentric, chiastic, parallelism. It's not amazing. The first two verses of, I mean, the, the terms aren't amazing. The structure of the text is amazing. Now, what I think is saying is, you know, don't race on. Do you know what Brother Harry Tennant used to say? The way to study the Bible, I remember him saying as a young person in a youth group, a youth, youth uh, weekend, the way to study the Bible is to read it slowly and let it open up as you read it. I don't think I realized what he was saying. I'm beginning to realize now that we need just to 
read those words slowly. It's not an academic exercise. It's not intellectually demanding, not suggesting at all. Quite the reverse. Just go back and read those words. When we look at the first 18 verses of John chapter 1, it's called the prologue of John, John, we see that there is an architecture there which has got this uh, concentric parallelism. Forget about the terminology, that's not what's important. But if you notice, the thing to notice about it, um, if you look at verses 6 to 8, you can't see the screen, don't worry, just I'll, I'll read it out. If you look at verses 6 to 8, you've got a reference to John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Well, when you come to verse 15, it's talking about John the Baptist again. John bear witness of him and cried, saying. So, verses 6 to 8, John the Baptist. Verse 15, John the Baptist. Now, you and I, if we were correcting a text of a school uh, essay, we'd say, well, you know, that's a bit all over the place. Bring them together. Talk about John the Baptist in one Say what you want to say about John the Baptist, then move on to talk about Jesus. But having moved on to talk about Jesus, he goes back to John the Baptist. And that's a feature of the scriptures that I've always found perplexing. I've, I've said to myself, oh, repetition, you know, it's thrown me off track. Here am I going down this straight road, and all of a sudden you bounce me off the track again, you've gone back again. We just passed John the Baptist, but, but now... No. And, what you have to realize then is that the text isn't going in a straight line. It's not a highway. It's more uh, a concentric pattern. So when you realize that, you get the wow factor because all of a sudden a familiar passage now opens up in a way that we didn't expect. Because if you'd asked me before I, I stumbled upon this, if you'd asked me, and I didn't invent this, this is, I've read some of the uh, uh, other uh, uh, writers on this, um, if you'd asked me just from the top of my head, what's the key thought in the prologue of John? I would have said verse 14. Right? I would have said the word was made flesh. That's the key point. I wouldn't have understood why I came into verse 14, not verse 1 or verse 18, but verse 14. And of course, that is a huge point. But I'd like to put before you the thought that actually what John's gospel record Inspired scripture is about, when we come to read John next time, have a think about this. It's about verse 12. Verse 12. Power to become the children of God. So let me just show you this. Uh, so. What happens is you get this pattern so that verses 1 and 2 are in parallel with verse 18. Have a look at your Bibles. Verses 1 and 2, we've looked at that. It's talking about in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. Oh, verse 18 then says, well, No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus is the word declaring the mind of God. In the beginning was the word. And you can say, how are we going to know that word? How are we going to know what God thinks? How are we going to get back to the beginning of God's purpose? Verse 18 says, the only begotten son. He's the way you get to know the mind of God. He has declared him. So, so verse 18 is to be understood alongside verses 1 and 2. They explain themselves together. So verse 3 is in parallel with verse 17. Verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now what's, what's, what's being made here? Well, this, this structure suggests that what is being made is salvation. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You can think about that one. Verses 4 and 5 go along with verse 16. In him was life, 
and the life was the light of men. Right, so the light of men. And verse 16 says, and of his fullness have all we received. That light, the fullness of that light has been manifested. We mentioned verses 6 to 8 and verse 15, giving us this uh, dual reference to John the Baptist. So when we go further in, right, verses 9 and 10 and verse 14 go together. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That was the true light. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The key point here is, and we beheld his glory. He was the true light. And we saw that light. Well, what was that light? It was the glory of the character of the Father. That's what we saw. Verse 11 says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to the Jewish nation, that was his own. He came to the Jewish nation, and they received him not. Because the gospel is only going to be received of those which are born, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. that's, That's quite a thought, right? He came unto his own, he came unto the Jewish world, But they didn't receive him because they were not born of God. What's John's gospel going to show us? Here is the Jewish nation and their leaders are going to say, we've got Abraham to our father. We have God to our father in John chapter 8. And Jesus says, no. If God was your father, if Abraham was your father, you wouldn't do what you're doing. You would not seek to kill me the Jewish nation had to realize that it had to be born of God. So the significance of this is it's immense. In chapter 3 of John, here comes Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the chief ruler of the Sanhedrin. I say ruler, the the teacher. If you look in verse 10 of John chapter 3, it says, Jesus says to him, Art thou the master, the teacher of Israel? So this confrontation is between the teacher of the Sanhedrin and the teacher sent from God. The supreme teacher of the Sanhedrin versus the supreme teacher. That's the significance. Jesus says to the chief theologian of the Sanhedrin, you must be born again. And he couldn't understand it. Look, if he has to be born again, everybody's got to be born again. There is no man, Nicodemus, higher in things legal and religious than you. You represent his own that he came to. You must be born again. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And to as many as received him. What does that mean? To them that believe on his name. What is to receive Jesus? You know, I think evangelicals will talk about the mystical indwelling, the, the, you know, the religious uh, feeling that people get when they, they think they're born again. It doesn't mean that. What it means is to believe on his name. That is to receive Jesus. To believe what he said. If we believe... He gives us authority to become the sons of God. Isn't that the most awesome thing? Do you see, that is the central thought. God is working a work through his son, who is the manifestation of the mind of God in living flesh. To do what? To make us children of God. And we must be born again. There's no other route. We have to have that word of God in us. That faith that makes us sons and daughters of God comes from that word. We can't treat this scripture, brothers and sisters, as an incidental to our religious activities. To give cursory attention to it once or twice a week. This is the lifeblood of faith. Faith. 
It's not for one or two enthusiasts to study on behalf of us all. It's not, it's not a competition either, brethren. It's for every one of us to bring this word into our minds as we're driving along. As our thoughts are roaming to bring us back to what the Lord Jesus Christ would have us do. And that 18 verses of John chapter 1 is marshalling our thoughts to understand that the whole power of God in creation manifest in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to make us, if we receive them, the children of God. What an awesome thing. Uh, Behind this, of course, is, is a whole wealth of scripture. Even to them that believe on his name. So what is it to believe on the name? Well, the name in Scripture has very special uh, connotations. And it's a reference back, and we'll know this, to Exodus chapter 3, where that name, I will be, who I will be, Ea, Esher, Ea. That's an interesting chiastic pattern, isn't it? I will be who I will be. Mystifies the scholars, absolutely mystifies them. If you read anything about what they write about uh, uh, the name of God, they have whole conferences discussing what it might mean. I will be who I will be. Well, who will God be? Well, it could be you and I. Children of God, of the name. Having the Father's name written in our foreheads. God wants to be manifest in a multitude of people like you and I. I mean, that's astonishing. If we'll take his word into our minds, if he'll allow his son, mediated through that word, to change us. Because we've got to be changed people. To believe on his name. So you've got two strands of thought coming together. First of all, believing on his name is something that comes from Moses in Exodus. I will be who I will be. What's your name? What shall I tell them? Tell them I will be. What if they won't believe? Says Moses in chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Well, show them this. But what if they won't believe? Even then, show them this. So believing on the name is what Exodus is telling us Israel had to become, to become the children of God. And in Exodus, they had to be born again. Passover was their rebirth. Passover was a new beginning. Here, the firstborn of God was brought into existence. And Passover was the beginning. If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 in your mind, what's the context of 1 Peter chapter 1? Passover. Have a look at it. Passover. Redeemed not by silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Right? Passover is about how a nation was born of the Word of God. But it's not just beginning there, it goes back to the, the, the fathers of old. What do you think of when you read, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God? Why was it that the people God chose were infertile? Why was it they couldn't have children, naturally speaking? Because he wanted them to know that it was not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He was speaking of spiritual birth. And even Jacob had to learn that. You know, Jacob, Jacob might have thought to himself, well, I got Abram for my grandfather. Never mind the Pharisees in the first century. I got Abram as my grandfather. I remember sitting on his knee. And our Lord works in the life of Jacob so that he can be born again. Not of the will of the flesh, but of God. Behind then these uh, verses in chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, is a whole set of Echoes, allusions, quotations, call it what you will, of Genesis chapter 33, 34. Let's look at some of them. Turn your Bibles open to to Genesis 33, 34. 
And you see there, unmistakable, and you'll maybe already have it written in your margins. If you haven't, young people, please think about doing so. Uh, you know, you might want to use pencil or whatever, but look, once you put it in your margin, you can always look back and say, I wonder why I put that there. But you'll recognize, if, if you're making a link between words, the similarity. So take, take the obvious one in verse 14 of John chapter 1, right? He dwelt amongst, we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. Now that's a, that's a literal word-for-word word rendering of Exodus 34, verse 6, the manifestation of the name of God. So full is the word abundant, abundant is the word full. You translate it whichever way you like it, they're exactly equivalent. Goodness is the exact equivalent of grace, and truth is the exact equivalent of truth. So this phrase stands there in the Hebrew, and it stands there in the Greek. When John through the Spirit, is telling us what we saw in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling us that what we see is what Moses heard. See, Moses could bring us to a point of waiting for the one to come. Moses couldn't show us. He could tell us about. But in Jesus, we saw. Moses could hear the name. Jesus manifested the name in the, which he, in the way in which he lived. Moses says, in chapter 33, verse 18, this is a key point, show me thy glory. John says, in Jesus, we see the answer to Moses' request. We beheld his glory. Now, there's a very strange phrase to our ears in John chapter 1, which is in verse 16, and of his fullness, there's a reference back to verse 14, but of his fullness... Have all we received and grace for grace. Now, what does that mean? Come on, brethren, sisters. You've done the readings more than me. Some of you have done it for 50, 60 years. So we've read this 120 times at least. Grace for grace. You've got a theory? What does it mean? It's an echo, I suggest to you, of Exodus 33. You see, in Exodus 33, Moses, who was, was a marvelous uh, man for us to, to emulate his desire to know God. Verse 13, now therefore, he says, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. Now, just notice that. Right? Exodus 33, verse 13. If I have found grace show me that I may find grace he's already found grace but he wants to find more grace isn't that what John is saying and grace for grace in other words we grow in grace we have found grace by hearing the knowledge of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and of that fullness we we keep growing that fullness is abundance of mercy and truth for us we have found grace, but we find even more grace as, as the power of the word of God in us is going to change us into the likeness of the thought, thinking of, of God himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are other links there, and you can see then that this immense statement that the Gospel of John is making is that what Moses uh, aspired to but couldn't achieve has now been manifested in the one who was the only begotten Son of God, the purpose of God from the beginning, made flesh, abundant in goodness and truth. And that's the new life that we're called upon to live. When we talk about being born again, brothers and sisters, that is it. Goodness, or grace, and truth. Sometimes they're spoken of as if they're in separate corners of the room, coming out to spar with one another. You emphasize truth, he emphasizes grace, and vice versa, as if somehow they were poles apart. But the point is, they're not. They're on the same side. Establishing or standing up for the truth does not mean that we are ungracious, or shouldn't, should it? Being Christ-like does not mean that we do not stand up for the truth. The new man in Christ, the new person in Christ, 
has got those attributes growing in them where the love of mercy and truth are sort of met together. And it may be that the absence of grace brings truth into disrepute. And the absence of truth brings grace into disrepute. The new person has a Christ-like mind. Now look at this. He was in the world, and the world knew him not. Isn't that lovely? Exodus 33, verse 13. Now therefore, Moses says, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. Moses wanted to know God. John says, Jesus came into the world and they knew him not. Here was the glory of God manifest and they didn't know him. But John 13, 17 verse 3 says, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God. So this being born again has now to do with a new acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. To know him. To be in his presence. To be a companion. Now have a look at this in John chapter 1. John is going to manifest, uh, John the Baptist is going to tell them who Jesus is or who, who the Messiah is. And this is what they're going to do. Look at verse 35. And again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus, as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, what seek ye? They sent him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. Now you think that's a nice little story. Why do we spend four or five verses telling us that two disciples followed him to his lodgings and they stayed there? What's that all about? Haven't we got more important things to write about? What is it all about? That is what it's all about. That's what discipleship is all about. So there's the Lamb of God. John, thanks, bye. So John is going to fade into the background. John was representative of the law to point out the need for Christ. Thanks, John. Where are you going, brother? I'm going to follow the Lamb of God. So they follow him. He says... Oh, what are you looking for? Where'd you dwell, Lord? Why did they want to know where he dwelt? Because they wanted to find out where he lived so they could be with him. He said, oh, come and see. Oh, wow, he's asked to come and see. Let's go and see. Oh, that's where you live. Oh, come in. What? Stay. That's discipleship. Living in the house with Jesus. It's not just a, some incidental detail that's put in there to, just to pad out the story. Read First John, the first epistle in this light. I'll quickly tell you. Come on, let's quickly go there. First John chapter 2. I don't know how much long, longer I've got, so I'm just going to press on here. First John chapter 2. Look at verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk as he walked. Now, do you just notice that phrase, as he walked? Verse 36 of John 1, looking upon Jesus as he walked. They followed him, where abidest thou? So the disciples now, following Jesus as he walked, and abiding in the house with him. And John says, He that saith, I know him, ought to walk as he walked. That walk was a way of life. 
You want to dwell with me in my father's house and many mansions. You want to dwell with me? Walk the way I walk. Follow me as you walk. And I'll invite you into my house. It's not beautiful, brothers and sisters. This isn't some casual thought of John. Oh, I remember that. You know, this isn't the work of men. This is true discipleship laid bare. Now, I want to point out something here from verses 19 to 25. There's a little section of scripture here, 19 to 25. And you, you might notice, for example, that in, in verse, um, verse 21, there's reference to Elijah the prophet uh, uh, and so on. And that's repeated in verse 25. Right? Right. So, art thou Elijah? Art thou that prophet? In verse 21. In verse 25. If thou be not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor that prophet. Right? So, so when you see that repetition, you must think, so hang on now. I read that a few verses earlier. Maybe a sign I've gone past the main point. And the main point is what Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, was telling us. This is what Isaiah 40 was speaking about. So that's just uh, one of these patterns. Instead of just, you know, riding as it were, reading roughshod, (laughs) it's not saying, actually, that repetition is giving a shape. It's giving a focus. And the central point is, so John, who are you? I'm not the Christ. Who are you then? I'm not Elijah. Who are you then? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's what that section of scripture is about. Now we go from verse uh, 26 down to verse 32. You notice some repetition. In verse 26, uh, John says, um, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. And in verse 31, he says, and I knew him not. So they don't know him. John doesn't know him. It's not till he is revealed by God. In verse 27, he says, He it is who coming after me is preferred before me. In verse 30, he says the same thing. After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. Those repetitions, now, you know, we've got all sorts of techniques for explaining that away, haven't we? Say repetition for emphasis and so on. But what actually it is, is not just repetition, it is, it is architecturally defining the shape of a text which brothers and sisters of old would only recognize by listening. And, and it's said that this is a way of, uh, that helps memorization of passages of scripture. If you've not depend, if you depend on your memory to think about these things, then it's going to make a difference. What is the central point of that section? The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It's a beautiful thing. John was the voice. Jesus is the Lamb of God. The context is Passover. What did Peter say about Passover? You must be born again. That's what Jesus is going to go on to describe. Now they came to, it was all done in Bethabara, and I'm going to skip over that. But let me go to the end section uh, of the gospel. Because here, you know, we talk about discipleship, but now here is Nathaniel. At the end of John chapter 1, you've got this startling statement by Nathaniel. Right? And Jesus says to Nathaniel, you know, you, you're going to see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And you've got in your Bible a cross reference to Genesis 28, verse 12, haven't you? Right? Yeah, I'm sure. Who hasn't? <laughs> yeah, most people understand that when we read John chapter 1, there's a reference. Now, what has Jacob's dream got to do with with the end of John chapter 1? Why does that come out of the blue? Well, it hasn't come out of the blue. Jacob's been there since verse 14. Not of the will of the flesh, but of God. And when you think of what Jacob's life was about, Jacob's going to reappear in chapter 4. There's going to be Jesus sitting on Jacob's well. So Jacob's there in the background. Jesus says to uh, Nathanael, a man in whom is no guile, and it's suggested that Nathanael might have been thinking about the life of Jacob on his way to his wedding in Cana of Galilee in chapter 2. 
So nobody doubts that set of cross-references. But the question is, why would the Lord and why would John record uniquely an incident which has to do with Nathaniel? Nathaniel was a remarkable thing, man, right? Remarkable man, because you know, John chapter 1 has all these titles of Jesus. And it is an amazing thing that when everybody else doesn't know who Jesus is, right, he came into his own, and his own knew him not. That here at the end of the chapter is a man who, because Jesus read his mind on one point, he says, Master, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. That's an astounding statement of discipleship. To recognize in Jesus the Son of God and the King of Israel. Isn't that an amazing thing? And so what Nathaniel is there for, brothers and sisters, is, is a type of discipleship. Now, it's so beautiful. That here's a man without guile. Guile gets in the way. We get in the way of the word of God. Our motives are not always straight. You know, we might study to win an argument. We might study to show ourselves to be wise. Our guile is one of our problems. But you as a man who was guileless. I just think, I'm going to get married. Oh, oh yeah, Jacob. Look what happened to him. He was sent off to get married. And the twists and turns in his life. And what happened to him? Oh, he became Israel. He had power with God. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. If you come back to uh, Genesis chapter 28, you'll see this astonishing link. Genesis chapter 28. Jacob gets this revelation of the angelic presence in his life. It's always going to be there. God is going to work out his promises You'll, the angels will be in our lives as well. We can rest upon that. The angel of the Lord is going to camp around us as well because we're children of God, because we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God promises Jacob that he will never leave him. And verse 16 of Genesis 28, Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, Surely Yahweh is in this place. Look. And I knew it not. That's what John is trying to say. Yahweh was in that place. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They didn't know him. But to as many as do know him, it's eternal life. Being born again is being born of the Spirit. It is about knowing Jesus. So what we've got there is this marvelous link of thought The world knew him not. Moses desired to know him. To know him is life eternal. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. That's what the nation of Israel had to come to terms with. They had crucified the Messiah. Yahweh was in that place. Manifest in his son. And they put him to death. But now they had opportunity through this gospel to receive him, to become the children of God. Well, weren't they already the children of God? No, they weren't. That's what John is trying to tell them. You're not the child of God by birth. You're not the child of God by pedigree. We're not children of God because we're fifth generation Christadelphians. This is our problem as generations go on. We lose the freshness of the first discovery and we dwell upon our heritage as if somehow that commended us to God. But Jacob had to know that he had to be born again. He tried to work out God's plan in his own strength. And God taught him time and time again 
that he had to cling on to God. And so his life was a struggle to become the Israel of God, and he became the Israel of God. The name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince that has power with God and has prevailed. The life of Jacob, the life of Joseph, as the agency by which God converted Jacob to Israel, is writ large in the gospel record of John. There are wonderful things to behold, dear brothers and sisters, in this word of God, to be able to read afresh, to start again, as it were, this time to read it slowly, to allow those words to open up in our minds and convey the power and the cleansing of the word of God to bring the life of the Lord Jesus Christ into our hearts and minds, that we might know him, to see how he thought, to feel how he felt, to act as he acted. These are the things that the word of God has come down throughout these centuries to our day. We can go and see it in the John Ryland's library. We can actually put it into our hearts and minds as we read this word of God day by day. May we, dear brothers and sisters, in these last days, renew our zeal for God's living word, that the Lord Jesus Christ might be alive in each one of us, that we might follow him as he walked, that we might dwell with him forever.